Well, now, in, 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 in these two sessions, um, you're going to be told how referendums are conducted. And first of all, we're going to hear from Dr. Conor O'Mahony, Senior Lecturer in Constitutional Law at UCC. And he um, is um, go, go, going to deal with legal regulation. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, it's very nice to, to be here to speak to you this morning. Um, my paper follows on quite neatly from Neve's paper earlier on. So Neve was concerned with the legal rules governing what it takes to pass a referendum and to get it across the line and for a constitutional amendment to be, become law. Uh, the focus of my paper is a little different, obviously connected to that, but what I'm really looking at are the rules governing the campaign period. So from the time that a referendum is called, uh, namely when the referendum bill is passed by the Oireachtas, up to the polling day when the votes are actually taken, uh, there are a set of legal principles which govern what is to happen, things that can happen or must happen and other things that, that may not happen during that period. Um, so I'm going to, to run through these and to, to flag the key principles and then to flag some of the discussion points which have arisen over the years around how well those principles work. So I'm not here to advocate a particular outcome, uh, but just to flag some things which you might like to discuss during your deliberations uh, to, to set up uh, the possible recommendations you might make. Uh, like Neve, I, I don't have PowerPoint slides, but uh, my paper is in your packs, uh, and I'll be following that fairly closely, so, uh, so you might find it useful to, to have that in front of you. Uh, the first thing that I want to, to look at is the whole issue of funding, uh, and I want to look at that from two different angles. First of all, the question of the role of public funds in referendum campaigns, and then secondly, private funds. Uh, so to begin with public funds, uh, this is an issue which is regulated by the Constitution. Um, now, interestingly, if you picked up the Constitution and read it trying to find the rules on public funding, you won't find them very easily because they're not really uh, stated uh, explicitly in the Constitution. But uh, as, as Neve mentioned earlier on, the Constitution states a number of very broad principles, and then those principles are uh, expanded upon in, in the courts. And two of those principles, one of them being the general principle around democracy and the ro role that the people have in the referendum process, and then secondly, the broad principle of equality, uh, have been read together by the courts in two decisions which were mentioned briefly earlier, the McKenna decision and the McChrystal decision, as imposing very particular rules around the use of public funds during referendum campaigns. Uh, and to put it at its most simple, the government is precluded from directly using public money to advocate for a particular result in a referendum campaign. Uh, that originally stems from the McKenna judgment, which concerned the second divorce referendum in 1995. On that occasion, the government had used half a million Irish pounds, as it then was, uh, in an overt campaign uh, in which they were advocating a yes vote. Uh, and that was found to take, uh, essentially, the, the democratic rights of those who were in favour of the vote and to place those on a higher pedestal than those who were opposed to it, and thus to be a, an unconstitutional interference with the democratic process. So the McKenna judgment established pretty clearly that the use of public funds to advocate on one side uh, is off limits. Now, there was some discussion after McKenna as to whether that is too restrictive a rule, given that a government will uh, be elected quite often with a particular uh, constitutional uh, reform agenda, uh, and that if they have that democratic mandate to carry out that agenda, there was some discussion around whether it is too restrictive uh, to say that they can't use public funds in pushing an agenda which has already been approved uh, to one level uh, during a general election. Um, but those recommendations ultimately, uh, or, or that discussion, didn't ultimately go anywhere. Uh, and instead, uh, what we see uh, on the other hand was the, the McKenna principles being strongly reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in a later case called McChrystal, which concerned the children referendum. Uh, so McChrystal did two things. One was it, it reaffirmed that public money cannot be used on either side of the argument, uh, or at least on one side only. Um, and secondly, McChrystal went a little further than McKenna in that McKenna concerned overt campaigning. So while in McKenna the government was very clearly saying we're pushing for a yes vote and we're using this money for that purpose, McChrystal was 
uh, concerned with an information campaign which was supposed to be neutral. So the government was, in one sense, trying to comply with the McKenna rules by saying this is just information, it's not advocacy for a yes vote. Uh, but when the materials were examined, it was found that the general tone of the materials, and the paper gives some examples of what I mean by that, uh, was biased on the yes side of the argument. Um, and the court accepted that this was unintentional, that there was no question of bad faith on the part of the government. Uh, but nonetheless, what McChrystal establishes is that the government can even unintentionally breach the McKenna principles uh, if the information which is provided using public funds uh, isn't neutral and impartial information. Um, so that's the, the basic rule. Uh, the discussion points, which I'm just going to briefly flag on that, uh, surround really the scope of that rule. How far does it extend? Uh, so we know it covers direct expenditure. What is a little less clear is the extent to which indirect expenditure is covered. So in both cases, the court would have said, for example, that ministers can use state transport while on the campaign trail. So that would be an example of indirect expenditure, uh, which is still favoring one side of the campaign over the other. Uh, and there are all sorts of other ways in which money might indirectly find its way uh, into assisting one side of a campaign more than another, be that in the form of public funds provided to political parties or to civil society groups, for example. The other question which uh, is interesting to consider is the difference between the rules which apply once the referendum campaign has been called, when clearly direct expenditure is prohibited, uh, versus the question of what the rules are before the referendum is called. Uh, so some referendums, as we know, involve lengthy periods of public discussion before the formal referendum campaign. Um, as currently read, if you were to look at McKenna and McChrystal, it would seem the rules only kick in once the referendum has been called. Um, and so there's a, a discussion to be had around whether it's appropriate for any rules to apply prior to that point. Uh, you know, is, is it acceptable for public funds to be used in a way that might advocate a constitutional amendment before the actual formal campaign period? Um, so that's the, the McKenna and McChrystal rules, and they govern the use of public funds. And obviously because of those rules, one implication of that is that the vast majority of um, funding for referendum campaigns has to come from private sources. Uh, so we also then have separate rules which govern the use of private funds. Uh, and these take a number of different forms. So there's three main ways you can uh, regulate private funding of ref referendum campaigns. Uh, one would be placing lim limits or rules around donations to campaigns. A second would be to place limits on spending by campaign groups. Uh, and then the third is around disclosure requirements so that there is transparency in where the money is coming from and what it's being spent on. Uh, so what we have in Ireland is we have two of those three. Um, so we have limits which are in place around donations that can be made to campaign groups. Uh, those are set out in the paper uh, and they vary depending on the nature of the donation. 100 euros for an anonymous donation, 200 euros for, uh, for individual donations, um, 200 euros for unregistered corporate donors, or 2,500 euros for registered corporate donors. Uh, foreign donations are prohibited unless they're from an Irish citizen. So that, broadly speaking, is the, the set of rules around limits on donations that may be made to campaigns. What we don't have in Ireland are any rules on what can be spent. So you are limited in the size of the donations you can accept from a single donor in a single year, uh, but you can spend every penny that you can raise. Uh, now the two sort of balance each other out in some ways because, uh, because the limits on donations are such that in a small country like Ireland there is a, something of a natural limit to how much money a campaign will realistically be able to raise. Um, what is, I suppose, some, somewhat outside of the scope of the, the regulation would be private individuals. So campaign groups, you know, political parties and, um, and campaign groups such as civil society groups are covered by these rules, but private individuals are not. So in essence, private individuals can, you know, if you had a very wealthy individual, they could spend pretty much whatever they wanted uh, in advocating for a particular outcome in a referendum campaign. So that's one thing which falls outside the scope of our current rules. We have disclosure requirements, which again are set out in the paper. Uh, so where you have a political party or a, a civil society group which accept donations above these thresholds, then there are requirements in place around uh, accounts which must be opened to handle those donations, um, around 
uh, reports which must be made to the Standards and Public Office Commission every year um, and uh, the information which must be disclosed. And so um, there is a, a fair degree of architecture uh, around that. Um, so looking at Ireland then and looking at those rules in a sort of international context to see how we compare to other countries on that. Um, on the question of donations, uh, our rules are reasonably strict. Our, the, the limits which we impose here are, are relatively uh, low limits. Um, the disclosure requirements are, are reasonably onerous. And we're also somewhat un unusual in the fact that we apply these rules to both uh, political parties and civil society groups. So uh, if you look at comparable countries in the OECD, for example, the majority of countries wouldn't apply those rules across both political parties and civil society groups in the same way as, as we do. Um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of countries do have limits on uh, expenditure, which we don't have at all. Um, so that is, is, is uh, another way in which we, we differ from, um, from a lot of trends. Um, so if you take a, one practical example I've given just to see how we look a little bit different to one of our near neighbours, if you look at, for example, um, the Scottish independence referendum and the way that would have been managed uh, in the Scottish referendum uh, campaign uh, on independence, there was no limit on donations, so parties could take, uh, you know, groups on either side could take donations as large as they wanted, uh, which would certainly differ from our rules, but then they were limited in what they could spend. There was uh, the lead campaign groups had a, a total spending limit of 1.5 million, and then there were other smaller separate limits for, for uh, political parties. And that looks quite different to what we do in that uh, while they could take donations as big as they want but could only spend so much, we do it the other way around. Uh, we say you can spend as much as you want but we limit what you can actually accept from individual people. Um, so, uh, so it's different um, and there's, a, I suppose, a discussion to be had around which is the, the more effective way of trying to ensure that, that each side of the, the campaign uh, gets an equal crack of the whip. Another thing which is done in other countries which we don't do uh, is channeling public funds directly to campaign groups. So setting aside a sum of money and saying that each side of the campaign is going to receive a certain sum of money from public funds in order to run their campaign. And that would be a, a relatively commonplace arrangement in a, a number of different countries. It's not something we do here. There is the question how that would ad, uh, comply with the McKenna principle. And I think uh, views may differ on this. My view would be that as long as a, an equal amount of funding was, uh, was provided on each side, that that would be compatible with McKenna, but it would have to be an equal sum of money given to both sides. Um, there are questions then as to exactly how you would make that work, how you could regulate that and police it, uh, which is a, a separate discussion. Uh, but that is something which, which is done uh, in a number of comparable countries, but which, as I say, we don't, don't currently do. The onus is on uh, the campaign groups to raise their own funds. Um, so that's the, the architecture around public uh, and private funding. Um, moving on then to the, the third point, which is the rules concerning media coverage, and in particular broadcast coverage. Uh, and this is something which many of you will have encountered. If you pay attention to referendum campaigns, you will come across uh, this whole notion of balance in the coverage, uh, the style of debates we have where you have two people from either, either sides of the argument and where broadcasters are going to great lengths to ensure that they receive equal time. Uh, now, the rules governing this, interestingly, are not specific to referendums. Uh, so the relevant rule comes from the Broadcast Act, uh, and the Broadcast Act is not uh, something which is referendum specific, it's something which applies to broadcasters at all times. And the Broadcast Act requires, uh, and it's, the, the section is in full in the paper, but it requires that the treatment of current affairs uh, must be fair to all interests concerned, the broadcast matter must be prevented in an objective and impartial manner, and without any expression of the broadcaster's own views. So those are the, the general principles, and those apply at all times, whether there's a referendum uh, being held or not. Now, they tend to become a, a particular focus during referendum campaigns because of a judgment which again goes back to the divorce referendum of 1995, uh, which is the call-in judgment. Uh, and that concerned uh, an issue which arose during the divorce referendum where... Uh, Essentially, you'll all be familiar with the idea of a party political broadcast, and during the referendum campaign, RTE afforded each side the sort of referendum equivalent of a party political broadcast, which were 10-minute slots uh, to set out their case for either voting yes or voting no. 
Uh, and what they did was they offered uh, a slot each to the, political, ma the main political parties and then one slot each to the main campaign groups. But because all of the political parties were all advocating a yes vote, the net effect was it that, of it was that the yes side received 40 minutes of uncontested broadcast time to advocate for a yes vote, whereas the no side received only 10 minutes to do the same on the no side. So that ultimately was found by the Supreme Court to be a breach of the Broadcast Act. Now, I think if you look at the requirement in the Broadcast Act that you must be uh, fair to all interests concerned, then the idea of 40 minutes of uncontested airtime on one side versus only 10 minutes on the other, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, a big stretch to say that that falls short of uh, adhering to that principle. The question then is how do you implement that in other circumstances? And what we've seen over the years is that uh, the implementation of this principle has really focused very much on that idea of equal time. That because the problem in Colin was unequal time, uh, there's a sense that you must give equal time in all circumstances. And they were uncontested broadcasts, remember. Uh, but what we see very often is that that has now translated into a requirement of equal time, even in the cut and thrust of a contested debate. And of course, that's much more difficult to make it work. Uh, you know, it's quite easy to say if you have your, your 10 minute broadcast, we, we equalize those. But uh, in a back and forth, in a robust debate, it's very, very difficult to ensure that each side has equal time, perhaps unrealistic. Um, but what we see very often is broadcasters using stopwatches during contested debates to try and adhere to that idea of equal time. And there is a question to be uh, discussed around whether or not that broad principle of being fair to all interests and concerned in, in, in the Broadcast Act uh, really is a, is a more flexible concept than this idea of precise equality of time. And it is questionable whether the, the call and judgment really requires precise equality of broadcast time in all circumstances. And I think that's something which is worth deliberating on. We've seen it filter beyond equal time into to some other uh, areas as well. We have seen it in some instances uh, filtering into unrelated programming. So we have seen circumstances where uh, people, you know, we've had incidents with people being asked to remove campaign badges from clothing during interviews which had nothing to do with a referendum, uh, or even recent reports about somebody being disinvited from appearing uh, on a TV show uh, for fear that it would uh, be broadcast during a referendum campaign and that there might be some issues arising from that. Um, many people would view uh, that implementation of the rules as being overly cautious and overly restrictive. Um, beyond that, there are one or two other points which, which are worth discussing. One is around uh, the extent to which broadcasters feel free to challenge arguments. So when you have people making claims during referendum campaigns, which may or may not be accurate, uh, broadcasters uh, may feel that it's difficult for them to really challenge those claims robustly, given that the Act says the broadcasters may not express their own view, and there's a fear on the part of broadcasters potentially that they fall into advocating rather than just interrogating. Um, and then finally, the other point which is interesting to consider is the fact that we have uh, this complex body of rules governing the broadcast media, namely radio and television. Uh, but when it comes to print media and when it comes to digital media and the increasing prevalence of social media and so on, uh, the rules uh, governing those are far looser, bordering on non-existent. Um, so if you are... Uh, I mean, if, uh, and, and when you consider the fact that there is now a lot of overlap, I mean, if you look at, for example, the RTE website versus a website run by a major newspaper, each of them will contain print content, video content, audio content. There's very little difference between them. But one of those operators has a very restrictive body of rules governing it. The other can do almost what it likes. Um, so there is a, a, a discussion to be had around whether it makes sense uh, to have a very detailed restrictive body of rules governing television and radio uh, while leaving print and digital media comparatively unregulated. Um, finally then, and I see I only have a, a couple of minutes left, just to, to mention the Referendum Commission, and Neve has already introduced the Referendum Commission to you. Uh, the Referendum Commission has uh, the role of distributing information to allow voters to come to an informed view and to make an informed choice at the referendum. It is, of course, bound by the McKenna principles. So in other words, any information that the Referendum Commission distributes must be impartial and neutral. It cannot provide information which is intentionally or unintentionally biased on either side of the debate. The Referendum Commission used to have the role of setting out the yes and no arguments as well, but that was removed in 2002. 
Uh, and so there's a discussion as to whether or not that was a useful function. Um, Niamh mentioned that earlier on. It was felt that it wasn't working very well. Um, so I suppose something for you to consider is in your own experience, uh, is that something which you found to be a useful function? Uh, there is a question about uh, the, the, the difficulty the Referendum Commission has in distributing information which uh, is interesting to voters nowadays, I guess. Uh, so Follow-up research, for example, after the children referendum is that, that almost half of voters found the Referendum Commission's ads and media materials to be long and uninteresting. Um, but of course, it's, it's operating in a very restrained environment. Fact-checking is an interesting question around the Referendum Commission. Does it have a role in fact-checking claims made on either side of the campaign? Because of course, misinformation circulates during referendum campaigns. Uh, is it appropriate or is it, is it useful for the Referendum Commission to fact-check? Uh, we've seen different practice on this. In some referendum campaigns, the uh, Commission has addressed campaign arguments, particularly in the marriage referendum. People might remember a lot of claims being made on one side around the connection between that referendum and the issue of surrogacy. The Referendum Commission repeatedly uh, came out and said that as far as they were concerned, there was no connection between the marriage referendum and the issue of surrogacy. Um, so was that a useful thing for the Commission to do? In other referendum campaigns, we've seen the Commission not do that uh, and staying away from that. The Act is flexible enough. It, it says the Commission can provide any other information that it considers appropriate. So it essentially gives it a choice to do that or not do it. And so I think it's worth considering, do we think that's useful and do we want the Commission to do that? And finally then, the, the last point, which I think Gary mentioned uh, in his discussion, is around the question of whether the Commission should be a permanent body. Uh, so the Commission at present is an ad hoc body. It's set up from scratch every time that a referendum is called uh, with a new chairperson, uh, and it has to get up and running in perhaps a very short period of time. Um, and that is a challenging thing for it to do, and so there is a discussion to be had around whether we think it makes sense for a more permanent body to be established which has more time, more resources, uh, has more of an opportunity to build up expertise in the area, uh, perhaps not dedicated specifically to referendums because we don't have enough of them maybe to justify that, but it could be combined as part of a broader electoral commission uh, which would regulate not just referendums but general presidential and local elections as well, um, and so that you wouldn't have that challenge the Commission currently faces of having to start from scratch every single time there is, there is a referendum. So that's a suggestion which has been made from various quarters over the years. Um, so I see my time is up. I will leave it there, but I'll be very happy to deal with questions later on. Thank you.